Please ask questions at any time and take shots. Uh, I realize that I have expertise in exactly one half of what I'm talking about today. So it's very dangerous and I understand that and I'll take the, uh, the shots as appropriate. The reason I'm interested in this and, and throwing the ideas out there is, a, are a couple of reasons. One, uh, we're actually, we, meaning humanity, so a very large version of we, are actually putting together serious plans for starting to colonize the outer solar system, essentially Mars at this point. We're also continuing to explore the outer solar system, particularly looking for signs of life. And if anything does turn up, that's gonna really ramp up uh, the intense interest out beyond uh, Mars and the icy moons or on Mars proper. So we are moving outward at highly variable paces. And with that comes the need for energy, particularly energy uh, if we establish installations of some sort or another. Going inward in the solar system doesn't look that likely right now. And when you do, you've got some readily available power sources there. So, the problem is how do you power facilities? I'm not talking about spacecraft. So facilities in the outer solar system. Our current methods each has significant drawbacks. Obviously solar, has been used a lot, but it has the inverse square problem with it. And even Mars is already getting on the edge of what's viable for powering other than fairly low uh, power density needs with solar. We've used fission extensively in the deeper parts of the solar system, but fission comes with its own drawbacks, particularly in terms of uh, weight and radiation. So what I propose is a possible solution of using geothermal power systems, at least in the right circumstances. But I think as we learn more, those circumstances are looking more and more common. I'll start off with a brief overview of geothermal systems uh, from our, the perspective of what we know of them here on Earth, and then move into how they could be applied in the outer solar system. So what is a geothermal solar system? And I realize some of you, I'll undershoot your knowledge level. Some of you, I'll overshoot a little bit. I apologize for that, but I wanna make sure we're all on the same uh, sheet of music here. So a geothermal system, a power producing geothermal system is based on extracting and utilizing heat that's in the earth. Generally, conventionally up to the present day, that's involved tapping into hydrothermal flow systems. And the flow systems themselves depend on water circulating in the crust, either just very deeply and heating up on the, uh, the geothermal gradient. That would usually be through deep faulting systems such as in the basin and range in the Western US, or circulating around a cooling magma body in some form or another. And so generally what's done in the exploration and production is you, you look for those upflow systems of the hot water, you drill into them and use that to drive power generating turbines in various methods. Uh, there's also generally multiple ways you handle the fluids early on. Generally they're just vented or exhausted or dumped back on the surface. That is not done nowadays pretty much universally, the, the spent fluid on the exit from the power production facility, what's captured is re-injected back into the ground. That's used to both keep the pressure up in the flow system, in the uh, geothermal system, and to help the recharge of fresh water coming in to be heated up. And again, those are, are fairly, that's fairly standard. It's a technology that's been around for a long time. An emerging new paradigm, which is where I'm mostly focused these days, is on geothermal anywhere. And that taps into the advances in drilling technology, allowing us to drill deep enough virtually anywhere, not worrying about a hydrothermal flow system, but just tapping into the native heat in the crust, circulating your own fluids, and then generating uh, electricity off that. 
there are a wide variety of schemes. I've got a few representations here of how you hoover up that heat in the earth. It can be through fracking of various sorts. And there are a couple of startups here at UT uh, by engineering professors on these ideas. Or a complex radiator pattern that doesn't use fracking, uh, which has obvious advantages, but some disadvantages too. And there are test projects like that and around, or just deep circulate up and down a wellbore uh, using concentric piping. And then lastly, a new, new one that actually we're just able to announce today that the Bureau and a startup company have been uh, given a phase one by the Air Force to look at installing a geothermal power plant uh, south of Houston based on this type of, uh, of uh, scheme for the heat extraction. The point being that there's a lot of existing methods, a lot of new methods of how to extract geothermal power. On Earth right now, it's widespread. It's been a, a commercial electricity producer for over 100 years, starting in Lardarello, Italy. Right now, the US has uh, far and away the most installed geothermal capacity, all of it west of the Rockies. But other countries, although smaller in total amount, can generate a significant part of their domestic power needs off geothermal. You see like around the rim of fire, the Philippines, uh, you have Iceland on its spreading center and others that generate a significant amount of, of power. So my bottom line for that is that it is a mature industry here. Also, it's not shown here, but generally, this is all working off a difference in temperature. So the difference in temperature at well, and actually pressure between ambient at the surface and the fluid reservoir in the subsurface, which is in the general range of about 150 to 250 degrees C. So we could very roughly round that off and say it's working off a temperature difference of about 200 degrees to generate your power, degrees C. So that's the status here on Earth. So how can we apply that to the outer solar system? Particularly, as you'll see as I go on, what I think is the juiciest target, which is the icy moons. And fundamentally, all that's needed is about a 200 degree shift to the cold side of the whole operating regime of a geothermal power system here on Earth, along with a decrease in exit pressure to zero. So let's take a look at that. We'll start off since we're talking about out beyond the Earth or going outwards from the Earth about Mars. Mars, however, is probably not the best prospect and I won't spend a lot of time on it. I know this, some people would disagree with it, but it's essentially pretty quiet tectonically uh, other than uh, relatively minor rumblings. It has low heat flow. Unfortunately, we didn't get an actual uh, drilled in-ground heat flow measurement uh, from our probes, but uh, still fairly low heat flow and gradient. Not much in the way of actic tectonics, although there is obvious evidence of occasional fluid flow at the surface, and that's probably the most tantalizing tease of geothermal potential that there is here. But what would be needed would be a substantial subsurface aquifer at elevated temperatures, and at this point, there's not much evidence of that. There is evidence of fluid in the, gr in the ground. Perhaps it'd be enough for a, uh, for a direct heat use as opposed to uh, thermal power production. And if I didn't mention earlier, generally, at least on Earth, what's needed for viable electricity production is temperature of your reservoir of 150 C or better. Uh, it has been uh, utilized at as low as 120 C, but it gets pretty marginal at that point to generate electricity with our surface conditions. But below that, uh, there's a lot of direct heat. And again, I'd point to something like Iceland that gets the vast majority of its building heat off ge geothermal power. So leaving Mars, going further out, we've got a lot of mostly ocean worlds and then there's Io. Io is kind of a unique case, which 
I won't go into here also in detail. Among other things, besides the different composition and regime, it's so active as to possibly be too dangerous to do much with in the near future. But it's also a totally different type of regime that you'd be tapping into, at least, um, at least chemically. So I'll focus the rest of this on the icy bodies, which is dominantly the icy moons. You could throw in perhaps Pluto, although it's not terribly uh, well constrained yet, on at least from the point of view of a geothermal potential. But you've got a lot of icy bodies. In fact, they're looking pretty common in the potential for most of them to have a subsurface ocean, either entirely or at least regionally, is looking better and better with time. So let's look at just a very generalized idea of the structure of one of these icy bodies. And in general terms, what you have is an icy outer crust with a subsurface ocean to some depth, perhaps with even things such as white or black smokers, similar to what we have here on Earth, off the bottom, depending on the circumstances, interface with a rocky core or perhaps sandwiching between different layers of, of ice compositions or such. But the fundamental structure is this kind of layer cake with a surface temperature on the order of about minus 200 C, and I realize that's highly variable, also a highly variable crustal thickness, but you have some uh, constants in there. Again, the ice crust, the venting is pretty common, and we might talk a little bit more about that in a minute, as well as a mostly water composition subsurface ocean at somewhere around what we'd consider the, the freezing point. And again, that also varies obviously with with pressure and composition and such. But again, this is looking at it from kind of a back of the envelope perspective. So I'm rounding things roughly to 200 and zero uh, for some simple calculations here. So looking at some of the uh, representative candidates that are out there, we have a range but a reasonably constrained ranges of temperatures, of surface temperatures and depths to ocean. And I know many of these are being revised on a continual basis. So again, spaghetti on a wall, generally probably a briny ocean composition to some degree. But what you uh, see here is a range, you know, minus 150 to minus 200 C as a good range, and by the way, apologies to uh, the astrophysicist. I'm used to working in C, I put K up here also, but I'm just used to working in C, so that's what I default to. But what this tells you is that if you've got a subsurface ocean and you've got known surface conditions, you've got, again, a temperature gradient or temperature difference here between your reservoir and your surface, and it's on the order of 150 to 200 degrees C. That's enough of a difference to make an earthbound geothermal engineer quite happy. Now looking at probably one of the juiciest examples here, and I know uh, some of the audience has done a fair amount of work on these topics and particularly Enceladus and others, but there's been a fair amount of good characterization done on this and you have an overall thermal output in the south polar region here on the order of 10 gigawatts thermal. But if you break that down into along the fissure lines, perhaps uh, individual discrete geysers, you're getting individual geyser outputs on the order of tens of megawatts thermal. And I think that's a significant starting point uh, when you're starting to look at, well, what would be the overall resource that you could tap? And again, you're not gonna tap a whole body here, but you're gonna tap a small region if you're looking to power a facility. So now we're getting into essentially a focus that would be more along the lines of what's a single geyser put out, although probably a lot smaller than that. And by the way, I don't have chat up. So if any questions come up, just interrupt me. So the very basics of geothermal power calculation, of what you can get out of a flow system. 
I ran some simple numbers here that would be typical for a, a single well on earth, which is on the order of a cubic meter flow uh, per minute. And a difference in this case, I took 173 degrees off one of the uh, samples that I was just showing. And a 50% conversion efficiency, which is actually pretty optimistic. 10 to 20 is a little better overall. But the point being that you get on the order of single digit megawatts potential uh, thermal or electrical output from a well if you can build it. And that's a reasonable amount. You can power a good size facility off that, even if you consider the probable heating load you'd need if you're gonna be trying to keep humans alive. If you're not, then robotic instruments wouldn't need nearly the same uh, life support power requirements. Now, up till now, it's just been very simple look at calculations. I wanna spend the last part of this talking about, well, what are the challenges? And there's a whole host of them. I realize that this is very pie in the sky uh, looking, but it's quite interesting. And some of these are actually uh, getting attention, although maybe not for this end already. So the engineering issues, and there's an awful lot of them. First, drilling to the oceans. You're talking about kilometers thick crust. That's an obvious major problem for a lot of reasons. You've got the drilling. You've also got the losses you would have on trying to bring a fluid up through tens of kilometers of ice. But what I will point out is where you've got outgassing and geysers, you've got areas where crustal thickness goes to zero. So if you can stand potentially the danger or tectonic risk of being close to one of those areas, you've got thinner crust potentially available. So that's one mitigating factor. As far as drilling goes, there's a lot of experience here on earth on drilling through ice. On the other hand, it generally requires a fairly massive infrastructure to do so. And conventional drilling probably just isn't going to be transferable to space to, despite what Bruce Willis may uh, portray in the movies. So what's left is probably melt drilling, I would say is the most favorable looking possibility. And that has been used here on earth and I'll show another slide in a minute about of prototypes that were put forward for missions to uh, the icy moons. So melt drilling or a combination of melt and physical drilling uh, has potential to reach a reasonable amount of depth, I think, in the right circumstances. Then you have the well bore. You can't just bring, say, water up through the ice to the surface to your uh, plant to flash into steam or turn into a whatever your uh, heat exchanger is. So you're going to have to case your well somehow or another. How would you do that? Well, again, the practicality of taking many tons of uh, iron tubing up into space is probably about nil. So you're probably going to be looking at some sort of 3D printing technology. That's certainly advancing rapidly and includes the ability to print things such as ceramics and metals now, along with a wide variety of plastics. So maybe there's potential there, although you still have your mass of source material you'd have to get there somehow or another. You also have your drilling waste removal problem. And that's a substantial one. Even if you've got a successful melt probe, you've got to deal with your waste material and getting out of the hole. So that requires some, some infrastructure and engineering. And then perhaps as much of a problem as anything would be this, the uh, borehole stability. No material you put in a borehole is gonna be able to withstand a major uh, shearing action in an ice crust. So. You know, how do you handle that? Can you find regions that are stable enough to allow a borehole to remain intact for what would at least be years of a time frame? Behavior of the materials at low temperature. Obvious issue there, although there's a fair amount known of metals and other materials that have been used in space before in the Arctic and such. Fluids, perhaps a more interesting problem. You know, again, if you shift your whole temperature regime 200 degrees to the cold side, 
what fluids might work or not work as heat exchange fluids that you can circulate down hole and bring back up to the surface. Your power plant design. Interesting questions here. Do you do a closed or an open system? Uh, what do you do with your spent fluids? You put them back in or do you just vent to the outside? There's a lot of options here. Odds are your environmental considerations may not be all that stringent at first and simply venting your material might not be an issue, uh, nor would I would assume deflating your icy moon too much, but uh, it's something to think about. The open or closed design is probably quite interesting. Do you go ahead and try to bring up fluid from the ocean to near the surface or the surface before utilizing it? Or do you ex heat exchange down at the bottom and then use a, a artificial fluid through the borehole up to the plant? A variety of things that can be done there. Again, you've got the problem of drilling through ice, but once you've done that, do you stop right below the ice and extract heat there or do you go deeper in? You know, if you can, if you can figure out where the equivalent of plumes are down on the lower interface, maybe you go ahead and go further in with a heat exchanger. And then of course there's construction. Uh, it's been talked about for decades about self-constructing robots and such, but we're a long ways from that. So, you know, how would you actually get the whole operation going? It's a major issue. All of this has been assumed to be essentially a step out from current geothermal plant uh, construction or design. But what are some alternate methods? You know, thermal couples are used in RTGs and space probes uh, currently, but they've experienced pretty severe degradation over time, uh, losing on the order of half their efficiency over a decade or so. So it's pretty substantial loss. But again, there's potential here. Uh, remember, you've got active geysers at the surface, so the potential of getting a very high Temperature gradient over a very short distance does exist, although obviously with some risk. But those are what I see as, as some, of the, uh, some of the major sections of engineering challenge to making an idea like this work. Nothing wrong with starting to explore them now. We've had as much lead time on everything else we're doing in space, so I think it's worthwhile. And some of this would direct, bear directly on future space exploration, especially the melt drilling aspects here. So I'm happy to see any progress being made there. And hopefully, although I don't think a, a drill made it onto the Europa Clipper, hopefully the next one out will. Um, I, I do appreciate that uh, uh, extraterrestrial drilling has not been terribly successful so far, unfortunately. So just a mildly deeper dive on the probes that have been looked at for potential uh, icy moon use. And you can see there have been substantial uh, design efforts uh, made here using a variety of, of power sources. Some are purely thermal, some are thermal and mechanical. But there's been some significant engineering uh, design work put into these. So I'm hoping to see more of that in the future. And again, uh, we'll see what the clipper turns up, but hopefully there'll be good justification for going back with more, more engineering in the future. Science priorities, most of these are gonna be tackled anyway, just from wanting to know everything possible about the bodies in the solar system. So things like ocean dimensions, the chemical and physical properties, pretty obvious on the shopping list, as is the crustal properties. You know, what are the potentials? I've seen only a little bit of work on this, but, but flows internal to the crust as we have here uh, on earth with magmatic systems. The tectonics, yep, obvious interest there. You know, when you're looking at the highly broken up terrain and active systems on these bodies, it certainly makes you wonder what at a finer scale the tectonics are like. Surface heat flow mapping. There's been some, some good work done on that, but there's a lot more to map along with figuring out how that would translate into the crustal temperature profiles in these bodies. 
along with obviously the ocean dynamics, the thermal structure, there's lots of modeling being done on that, relatively unconstrained at this point, but continuing to advance. The one area that probably doesn't get attention just in the natural science exploration is the modeling of the potential of these geothermal systems. So that might be an area that uh, would be good to team up with a, a terrestrial heat and fluid flow modeler to see what we can get out of, out of an artificial system under these circumstances. So that's a pretty quick run through. It's not in high detail because again, this is still a spaghetti on the wall stage, but I hope uh, to get some questions and some discussions going on this. So I'll open it up from the floor now, please. Okay. And I'll does, stop sharing. Yeah. Does anybody have questions for Ken? Uh, I have a question. This is Cindy. Please. One of the concerns, of course, when we go to other planets is making sure that we don't contaminate the planet with life forms while we're looking for evidence for in situ life forms. So I was wondering how difficult it will be to do that with the type of equipment that you would need to be drilling through a deep ice layer like that. Uh, good, good question. Obviously that, that is a growing concern. Two things I'll say to that. One, I would think that with the melt probes, you'd be fairly safe. We could get those above even extremophile uh, survivability in that regard. So I think you could certainly minimize risk. Uh, you know, a lot depends on whether we find any evidence of life in these oceans. Uh, that would definitely change your whole approach to how you do this or whether you'd even want to establish facilities there of one sort or another. The other thing I'll say though is it is a darn tough problem here on earth and the people are drilling deep into the ice or even deep into the crust, uh, the rock crust, uh, trying to prevent contamination when they're looking for the very deep biotas here is a big problem, which I am not very well versed on. So I can't say where the state of that stands. There may well be someone here who could uh, chime in with a little bit on where that state of the art stands. Anyone here an ice driller? Okay, well, feel free to chime in in a little while if anyone does. Okay, Ken, I have a question about the overall logistics and so forth of doing this. I mean, from what you were saying- No, 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 please, no, I can't answer yeah. those. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, from what you're saying, obviously um, this is a way of producing sufficient power for human um, exploration of some body. Yep. And or a major robotic facility or a major robotic. Yeah, I was going to ask, can the drilling be done completely robotically and the establishment of the power station and so forth? Because I was just thinking that, you know, you would land something on a body and it would certainly take a long time to actually do your drilling and get everything functioning and working. And if you have humans there at the time, you have to, first of all, allow for power until you can actually get this done. And then mm -hmm. secondly, it had better work. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, uh, fair questions. Uh, shooting from the hip here, you know, particularly if you're talking to icy bodies, there's not really any way around using fission for the time being uh, mm -hmm. for your starter power. And that can have a pretty decent lifespan. Um, yeah. So I would imagine going in with that. The drilling itself, the drilling, I think, can be done fairly easily remotely. The problem is everything else behind it, uh, from casing your hole to, to connecting the piping and such. It would take some much more sophisticated robotics than we've got right now. Uh, we're kind of bridging from both sides. Now, I will say that uh, uh, Eric Van Ort here in the uh, Petroleum Engineering Department can run a drilling rig remotely. Uh, now and has a lab that does that. But you still need to set up that massive drilling rig and bring in piping and everything else in between. So you're still stuck for the foreseeable future with that. I think the most viable path out will be 
printing on the spot and basically extruding as you go in some way or another, or following it down with extrusion from the surface. Uh, that's, I can at least envision that happening. You still got to get your raw material there, which probably isn't going to be abundant on an icy uh, body, but is abundant elsewhere in the solar system. So hopefully you wouldn't have to lift it out of our gravity well. But uh, yes, there's going to be, you know, in any first time thing, there's going to be some risk on can it work? And you'd also want to know some other stuff in advance, particularly, I think, the tectonics. That's the one thing you're really going to have to know because the slightest shear where you're drilling is just going to, it's going to shut off your hole. And that would be a real problem, once, especially once you are dependent on that and don't have any other backups available. Yep. Okay, thanks. Um, I see Judith has a question. Oh, let me call up my chat so I can see too. Uh, yes, it's, I was just okay. wondering, I know it's far in the future, but asteroid community is already thinking about the international implications, you know, who can use the resources of an asteroid? Uh, can you claim an asteroid? And I was just wondering, was there any uh, work done on this area when you talk about you know going to these moons obviously you need many expertise and many different countries are doing mm -hmm. and i would expect that they want to be in on so is there uh is there any uh way people actually discussing how could that mm -hmm. be done internationally or would that be just us alone okay well uh two Two ways I'm going to approach that. One, you know, frankly, I think the future for at least major projects is going to be a business case as opposed to government, but we'll see on that. Cooperation in space, we all can see really as well as I can on how that's going. It kind of comes and goes and fits and starts. The law side of it, is a little more interesting and a little more encouraging. One is being driven by need. When you have people like Musk talking about colonizing Mars, that's kind of kickstarted uh, re-looking at space law, which right now can be summed up in a few pages. Space law is very, very thin and really was built expressly to keep the US and Russia, or the US and USSR, sorry, not Russia, uh, from taking their nuclear competition into space. And it is grossly inadequate for anything else, including what we're doing nowadays. Uh, basically, the law right now essentially states that what the, the owning, what is it? The country that the person, company, or whatever is from is responsible for their actions in space. And so that makes it kind of interesting and has opened up the theory, including I think US, I, I'm speculating freely now because I'm not a lawyer, so I'm not bound by any knowledge here. Uh, but the US, I think, has filed a law giving our own citizens rights to claim mineral resources in space unilaterally. So that has basically no strength in international law at this point. But the whole field is really reviving now, driven by necessity, because as you say, I think asteroid mining is in our relatively near future and will probably be the first big tests of the whole idea of who can own what and do what in space. Um, so it's a fascinating question. I think it'd be interesting to have a partnership with uh, the law school in that regard. I know there's people that are interested in space law and uh, pull them into uh, the center in some way if they aren't already. But uh, very interesting question, but not one I can speak any more than I have already on that. But I tell you what, any of you can become experts because current space law is only about three or four pages. <laughs> but there's a new class on Thanks. space law that some of the engineering students have started to take. Is it out of the law school? I'll have to look Yeah, it it's up. out of the law school. Oh, it's been an active area for a long time, but just getting anything to be passed by multiple countries has been really hard. We had the initial space treaty, and then there was a fairly broader uh, amendment to it, but it was never adopted by the major space players.
Okay, do we have uh, further no. questions from anyone? David? David? I, so can you do a, a conservation of energy argument about basically if, if you got to melt your way down through X kilometers of ice and it has to be so many centimeters across the hole, you need, and you have a time scale over which you're going to do that, uh, you know, like one year, one earth year or something mm -hmm. like that. That means a certain power output. Mm -hmm. And so you need a certain nuclear source, presumably to do that. Um, if you got, if you're going to drag that much nuclear source there and and you're going to have it there anyway, why not use that as your heat source? I mean, it doesn't have to be then as an RTG because an RTG is designed to be provide quiet power over many years at very low efficiency. Mm -hmm. You don't need that. Uh, I mean, if you ran it at yeah. sort of nuclear power plant scale efficiency, you could make a lot better use of your nuclear payload. Well, a, a couple of things on that. One, you've still got you know, a, a moderately large amount of mass you've got to lift up, which may not be avoidable in, in my idea anyway. And you've got the radiation issue. But I think what might be the real difference maker is you then have to pull up that generator for every facility you're going to have. Whereas once you get a geothermal power source started, you've got power that can then be repeatedly installed using that as your starter. So that I think the scalability of this, once you've gotten your first installation in place, uh, might be the deciding factor versus having to cart up, you know, a fission plant for every place you're going. Shooting from the hip. But, and the other thing is, you know, obviously you've got a, a at least in some ways, a better safety factor, but a well-managed geothermal system can have an indefinite lifespan too. So it has a very long, uh, long time period where that you can amortize your investments over. Yeah, but science only has a certain political horizon, time <laughs> horizon to it. Yeah, that's some of those messy details again. But yeah, I, I get your point. It's a valid point. I just think a conservation of energy argument would strengthen. That's a good follow on. I'll add that to my, uh, to my list. Yeah, there was several years ago, I was on a National Research Council committee that was looking at uses of nuclear power in space. And this was a committee that was actually led by Ed Anders. So it was a uh, kind of fascinating. Um, the one of the ideas along this whole line of drilling down and using geothermal power, uh, somebody came up with, you know, just on the fly, a, a concept of having sort of a self contained unit that would do what what David was suggesting have a nuclear power source produce heat that would melt down. And then as it sank down, it would sort of build the casing behind it and just work its way straight on down. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if anybody has managed to follow up on that and actually develop the idea, but you know these are you know some concepts that have been sitting out there for a while, and I don't know if they've been written up or 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 what, but you know people have been looking at mm -hmm. this for a long time. That's somewhat similar to uh, the fission-powered melt drills that have been postulated, although they, mm -hmm. they didn't have the to build it as you go. Um, or maybe you can just, without having to sink your whole power plant as you go, maybe you just use the heat to, to water drill or something, your, yeah. your deal, or microwave drill. Microwave drilling is going to be tested out sometime soon. There have been some small scale tests, but there's other types of drilling that are being tested right now in the uh, oil and gas and geothermal world, uh, one of which I hope to get tested at our uh, Bureau's test site uh, South San Antonio, but using rail guns to drill and using microwave to melt drill in in rock. Both of those have been uh, patented and have startups around them right now. Okay. Um, um, there's also, Larry. Yeah, Larry's got his hand up. Yeah. Uh, 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 more generally, um, what about sources of 
mechanical sources of energy that uh, could be converted to heat. For example, we have uh, tidal heating going on in, in various various planets. Uh, I mean, I mean a, a rising tide can compress something, and you mm -hmm. change in pressure. Can you extract energy energy from that? Uh, or, or underground, <coughs> you might have regions um, uh, where the uh, ability to stretch or compress is is especially variable, and from that, uh, devise a way of extracting energy. Uh, what what about broadening the uh, perspective from just thermal sources to me mechanical and other sources that might be converted to heat or, or at least expended in, in terms of useful energy? The other thing that's interesting, there are uh, certainly ideas that are, I think, in kind of prototype or maybe beyond prototype stages for harnessing those types of energy here. I do not know the engineering of those types of systems. I have thought about the fact that if, you, if you're geysering material on these icy moons, tens or hundred kilometers into space, you've got some mechanical energy there also. Um, so maybe that's a possibility. And certainly here uh, in, for instance, old oil fields co-located with the wind generators in West Texas, there's a lot of interest in using earth batteries where you push thermal mechanical energy down when you're producing lots of wind or solar and then extract it later. Um, it'd be interesting if there's enough flexure. Y'all, several of y'all know a lot more about the, uh, the flexing dynamics of these bodies than I do and what might be able to be harnessed there. So please chime in. I don't know how much, how much uh, tidal flex do you get on one of these icy moons? Enough to mount the surface. Well, I can say something about that. The Please. Enceladus plume you showed has a diurnal variation. As Enceladus goes around Saturn, the plume, the particulates that are seen in the plume uh, get brighter and dimmer during the day. And there may also be uh, longer term variations. This is suggested as being due to tidal flexing of the crust of Enceladus that bring that's either opening and closing the cracks or my feeling is creating internal stresses in the moon, which basically lower and raise the water table in time. Hmm. Um, but it's certain, it, those have been confirmed. The, that is the, the existence of the diurnal variation is confirmed. Uh, and it's probably what's keeping Enceladus liquid inside. Very interesting. You know, there might, just thinking one more thing, if, if anyone here writes science fiction, it'd be an interesting science fiction story back to Cindy's deal. So say you do install one of these systems and you're dependent on it, and then it gets clogged with biological life forms in the intake later on. <laughs> How do you fix that? Yeah. Abundance. <laughs> we have that problem right here at the, uh, the dam on uh, Town Lake, I think. Any other questions? Good, good uh, stimulating questions. I appreciate the uh, the give and take here. Well, let's all thank uh, Ken for a fascinating and uh, thought provoking uh, talk. Yeah, thanks, Ken. Thank you all much. Okay, thanks. Thanks, Ken.